These are chaotic times. These are confusing times. Perplexing. We are all baffled. We are all puzzled. We are all worried. A trifle paranoid, perhaps. Wary. Cautious. We've been self-isolating long before social distancing and we have been wearing masks of the virtual kind long before the pandemic. We all reach out and then we retreat, approach, avoidance. And this is because the world had become an enigma, wrapped in a puzzle embedded in a mystery. In short, we no longer feel at home. I will try to be of some help here. I'll try to introduce order, structure and meaning into the world as it is today. And I will attempt to do this by studying the way the world had always been the immutable, unchangeable patterns and rules that govern our universe now and always had for millennia. We are human beings. We have been human beings 5,000 years ago. We have societies and cultures. We have had societies and cultures 10,000 years ago. There's nothing new under the sun. And our internal dynamics may be affected by fads and fashions and technologies, but they haven't changed that much. It takes millions of years for such changes to occur. And we are a very young species. So I think we can learn a lot by studying history. Let's start for, with the fact that politics has been with us forever. There had been politicians in ancient Babylon. There had been politicians in Persia arguing with King Xerxes. There have been politicians who surrounded Alexander the Great, who had debated, who had implemented policies. But for millennia, until very recently, Politicians had represented the interests of the elites. Politicians were the long arms, the extensions. They were the employees. They carried out the instructions of the elites. They managed, politicians managed, the bureaucracies what some conspiracy theorists call the deep states, the deep state. Politicians managed the bureaucracies, the agencies, the institutions of governance, which were required to ensure the smooth running of polities and economies. And who needed political entities and economies to run smoothly? Yes, you guessed it, the elites. It was all about the elites. Politicians were pawns in a game of chess played by the elites. That has been the case for well over 10,000 documented years in prehistory and in written history. Politicians were therefore totally identified and at the mercy of ruling elites. Now, the identity of the elites sometimes may have changed. Sometimes the clergy were members of the elites, sometimes not. Sometimes the aristocracy, sometimes not. Sometimes only the royal family. And there were periods in history where intellectuals were actually among the elites, like today. So the composition of the elites, who exactly is an insider, who is a member of the club, that depends on the period in history. But throughout history, 
there was a tiny, tiny, tiny crust, much less than 1%. And this tiny sliver of humanity used bureaucracy, used institutions, used the law, and used politicians, not necessarily to accomplish any goals, but to secure an environment in which goals can be accomplished. A favorable environment, a stable environment, sometimes nepotistic, sometimes cronyist environment, networks of patronage. It's true, but the emphasis was on stability and a playing field which favors the elites at all times and allows them to increase their wealth in a linear manner over uninterrupted centuries. Wealth, wealth amalgamation, wealth creation, and the distribution of wealth and the transfer of wealth between generations were the main focus of elites throughout history and to this very day. But something happened, something happened at the end of the 18th century. Starting with the French Revolution, the organizing principles of political establishments were challenged. Monarchies fell apart. Empires disintegrated. Something was afoot. And what had happened, what precipitated this sudden change, was the printing press. The printing press democratized knowledge and access to knowledge. Suddenly, much larger swaths of humanity had access to data which previously had been the exclusive reserve and domain, for example, of the church, the vernacular Bible, Martin Luther King's Bible, King James's Bible. They undermined the authority of the church. And the church, of course, was in most eras of, of history a member of the elite, a privileged member of the elite. So this was the first development. The second development, which precipitated the transition from elites to masses, the second development was the sheer numbers. Population on Earth had begun to explode. Numerically, there were many more people who belonged to the masses then people who belong to the elites, it became much more difficult to control these giant clusters of population. The Black Death, which had decimated one, one third to one half of Europe's population, only made matters worse as far as the elites because were concerned, because it made labor very scarce and it, it necessitated a vast transfer of wealth from the elites back to the masses, back to the people. In other words, labor wages increased dramatically because there were no workers left. Most of them had died in the Black Death, in the, in the plague. So the increase in numbers, the increase in literacy, the democratization of science and scientific endeavor and inventions gave rise to the copyright and patent laws. Gradually, power was seeping away, filtering out from the hands of the elites down to the masses. And a new layer was created between the elites and the masses, the middle class. The middle class aspired to join the elites, but belonged psychologically, culturally, historically, and societally belong to the masses. The middle class was a bridge between the masses and the elites. And the elite elites saw an opportunity here to co-opt the middle classes. So they introduced dreams and fantasies. The American dream. The American dream was about members of the middle class becoming members of the elite. The elite, in other words, became socially mobile. 
now you could be born on the wrong side of the tracks and end up in a mansion or president of the United States. So degrees of social mobility and social freedom were introduced into the system by the elites as a way to compromise the middle class and control the masses via the middle class. Because you see, the masses hated the elites, always, always. The masses wanted to kill the elites, and very often did. The masses, masses wanted to destroy the elites because the masses were perniciously and virulently and viscerally envious of the elites. They wanted to remove the object that created these frustrations and envy. They wanted to literally assassinate the elites. And in the French Revolution and in the Russian Revolution, they did copiously. But the masses did not hate the middle class. The masses saw a reasonable chance and opportunity to join the middle class in a variety of ways, by, for example, via education, via learning a trade or a skill, apprenticeship. So the middle class was an outlet it was a steam valve because it, it enabled the illusion, because it was an illusion, it was a lie. It enabled the illusion of social mobility. And it allowed the elites to use a, one part of the masses against another, divide and conquer. The middle class became the Trojan horse of the masses, became the fifth column. The middle class betrayed the masses. They were traitors, as the fathers of communism had correctly observed. The middle class chose sides, and it chose the elites, and it went against the masses. So there was a three-pronged war going on. The elites and their cohorts, the middle classes, against the working classes, the masses. So for millennia, politicians also had to choose sides. And until very recently, they had chosen the sides of the elites. Then, as the middle class had expanded, they chose the side of the middle class. But there was not much difference between siding with the elites and siding with the middle class. The middle class was the, were the emissaries, were the extensions of the elite. They were like the poor cousin cousins of the elite. They belonged to the elite family. They were on their way to becoming elites. Some, some of them did. So politicians didn't have a hard time choosing between elites and middle class. They were one and the same. But they were definitely against the masses. The founding fathers of the United States of America, ostensibly, allegedly, the greatest democracy on earth, detested the masses. They were terrified of democracy. That's why they created the Electoral College. They firmly believed that mass democracy leads to tyranny. And history bore them out. Hitler was an elected leader. On a much lesser note, so are Bolsonaro. So, is, so was Donald Trump. The masses, the masses gravitate towards strong men. They end up, via the process of mass democracy, creating tyranny. And so the founding fathers were terrified of the masses, and they created a non-representative democracy. And as the, as the politicians were trying to constrain the masses by collaborating with the middle classes and the elites, the masses were becoming more and more restless because they were becoming more and more numerous. The masses had to compete for scarce economic resources. And these scarce economic resources were hogged, were monopolized, were devoured by the middle classes and the elite. Income inequality reflects the fact that the vast majority of wealth assets and income is owned by something like 1% of the population. And that something like 70 to 80% of the population go to bed hungry 
or destitute or desolate, have no meaning and purpose in life, and are subjected to mass fantasies, mass manufactured fantasies. And so, as the 18th century bled into the 19th century Industrial Revolution, the Industrial Revolution leveraged the masses to create consumer goods and other modes of transport and communication and, and so on, construction, for the middle classes. So the work of the, of the working classes, the proletariat in, Marx, in, Marx, in Marxian terms, Marxist terms, the work of, the, of the, the, the labor of the working classes had been converted into consumer goods of the middle classes and permanent capital assets of the elites. And the working classes resented this. Hence socialism, hence communism, hence Nazism, hence fascism. These were all movements of the masses, movements of the working classes. In short, for 10,000 years, or let's say for 9,800 years, the elites were in control. They created bureaucracies and they let politicians run the bureaucracies. In the last 300 years, a middle class had been created. It emerged from the masses and it reverted to the elites. It collaborated with the elites. It compromised itself by collaborating with the elites. And the elites were fine with this because the middle class had always been small. And they, you know, the elites threw them some crumbs to make them feel good and encourage fantasies of social mobility and riches and, you know, the American dream. And the middle, middle class was happy and the elites were happy. And then in the last hundred years, the masses could take it no more. And we started to see mass movements. Mass movements which had all the hallmarks of religions, secular religions, and which were founded on ideology. Ideology is the poor man, the ignorant man's philosophy. It's basic, it's demagogic, it's not very sophisticated. You don't have to have, to have too, too much brain to comprehend it. It has, it's prescriptive, it tells you what to do. And it's dichotomous. It's black and white thinking. There's the enemy and there's you. There's us and them. So ideologies are a poor, ignorant man's philosophy. And of course, ideologies had quickly transformed into religions, secular religions with secular saints, secular rituals. Just have a look at any May Day parade in Soviet Russia or in China, to understand what I'm saying, or in North Korea today. So the masses reacted to their enslavement by the elites and later on by the traitors, the middle class. They reacted with mass movements, with mass ideologies. And they tried to uproot, to dislodge the elites at first. So the first impulse was kill the elites. And they did. Physically, they killed the elites. They decapitated them. They shot them. But then the mass movements changed course mysteriously. Sometimes they changed course because they became the establishment. The communists became Bolsheviks, and the Bolsheviks ruled Russia. So there was no need. They became the elite, the new elite, the nomenclature. So in some cases, mass movements were compromised by their own success. The Nazis, which were an, an outlier, outside outcast political movement, had become the rulers of Germany. Same with the communists in Russia. And so same with the fascists in Italy. The fascists were, or the leaders of, of the fascist movement, including Mussolini, were actually communists. Goebbels was a communist. All mass movements have very close affinity. And so when they came to power, they became the establishment. 
and they did not want the masses to continue to be rebellious. They did not want the masses to identify them as the new elites and then to attack them as they had attacked the old elites. So a new consensus had emerged. The masses now didn't try to kill the elite. They didn't try to beat the elite. They tried to join the elite. They demanded a part of the spoils. They demanded a redivision and redistribution of wealth. And we, and we came up with the income tax. The income tax is the elite's way of redistributing some of the wealth, some of the money, back to the poor. It was a concession by the elite on the surface. Because if you look at the numbers, most of the money most, most of the tax money, including the latest, the latest relief packages, COVID-19 relief packages, most of the money goes actually to the middle class or to rich people and to companies, enterprises, corporations, not to poor people. So it was a soap. It was a confabulation. It was a lie, but a comfortable lie. So distributive taxation, socially progressive taxation, was the way that the elites allowed the masses to share in some of the benefits. The welfare state was born as a way to contain the masses and convince them that the elites are going out of their way to make life happier and richer in every possible way. Suddenly there were mass institutions of culture and art available. Museums opened their gates to the masses, which never happened before. So this is where we were. Um, this is where we were in the 1960s. By the 1960s, all monarchies and all empires had crumbled in slow motion. This slow motion was accelerated after the First World War, when the inefficacy, incompetence, and sheer stupidity of the elites was exposed. The malevolence, the, the, the real conspiracies, the, I mean, the underbelly, the seamy side of the elites was exposed glaringly in the First World War, and a whole generation of young men was decimated. And so after 1918, and well into the end of the 1960s, empires fell apart and monarchies vanish, vanished. The masses started to make demands and by now the masses were no longer no longer homicidal they no longer wanted to kill the elites they have tried this it didn't work the masses had discovered something about themselves they are not good at governing the masses tried communism the masses tried fascism the masses tried nazism it didn't work well the masses even tried labor governance, labor parties in various parts of the world, from Italy to the United Kingdom, it didn't work well either. Masses are not built to govern. They don't have the internal intellectual capital, they don't have a tradition of governing, and they don't have the necessary skills and knowledge, etc., etc. They also are not well connected. Governance is about networking, is about leveraging social capital. The masses didn't have this. So by the 1960s, the masses had realized that they need the elites and they need the middle class to provide them with an environment where they as masses can survive somehow and even potentially be socially mobile and join the middle class. And so the elites and the masses struck a truce, an armistice. There was a tense, tense equilibrium between elites and masses. Let's recap before we continue. For a long period, for the longest period of time, the elites ruled unfettered, unchallenged. Elites and only elites were in charge. Politicians were the long arms of the elites and they managed the bureaucracies on behalf of the elites. Then masses began to rise for a variety of reasons that I had mentioned. And the, mass, the first thing the masses did, they killed the elites. And the masses, over a period of 200 years, came up with their own institutions, their own, their own religions, their own ideologies, their own solutions. 
and the masses tried to take over from the elites. They had Nazism, they had communism, and the masses discovered it's not working. They are not equipped to govern. They need the elites, the intellectual elites, the financial elites, the hereditary elites. They need elites. So what the masses did, they co-opted, they, they, they co um, kind of negotiated a truce or an armistice or a cohabitation or coexistence with the elites and, and the agents of the elites, the middle class. And this is where we were in the 1960s. The masses began to assert their power. And the masses formed at first in the 1930s and 40s, they formed chaotic ochlocracies. Ochlocracies is, ochlocracy is mob rule. Nazi regime was an ochlocracy, mob rule. And they created ochlocracies and they executed millions of, tens of millions actually of people, including large parts of the elites. It didn't work. So by the 1960s, everyone, everything froze. The elites were where they were. The middle class was in the middle, middle class, and the masses were awaiting. Everyone was in, a, in this tense, tense stand, down, stand down, like what's going to happen next? Everyone was frozen by the lights, like a deer with headlights, you know? The elites tried desperately because they, they realized that things were going the wrong way for them. They looked to the, to the West and they saw decapitated, decapitated noblemen in France. They looked a bit to the East and they saw a royal family uh, bullet riddled in Russia. They looked further and they saw the Labour Party taking over in the United Kingdom. The earth was shaking. The elites were terrified. The elites were absolutely terrified. There was a yellow scare. There was a red scare. So what the elites tried to do, they introduced a variety of fiction, a variety of pieces of fiction, a variety of narratives, a variety of stories, a variety of movies, movie scripts. And they tried to sell the masses on these movie scripts. So one of these movie scripts is liberal democracy. Every four years, you get to tell us who will be in the elite. The elites told the masses, you have power. You have the power. You decide who will be a member of our club, which of course is utter nonsense. Democracy is a sham. It's a sham. It's also an exceedingly bad idea because democracy led to Adolf Hitler. And not comparing, but democracy led to Donald Trump. Democracy is a horrible idea. The masses are not built to govern. They don't have the qualifications, the knowledge, the capacity, the mentality, nothing. Masses should not never ever vote. But the elites were so terrified, so panic stricken that they introduced universal suffrage, universal suffrage, universal voting. And they included minorities such as women and, and ethnic minorities and so on and so forth in this sweeping universal suffrage, in this sweeping universal democracy. And the second idea, the second idea that they had introduced was the nation state. So elites tried to subdue the masses, to subjugate them, to control them, to manipulate them, to channel their energy, to derive maximum benefit from the masses by, on the one hand, giving them um, Ill illusory uh, freedom, illusory mobility, illusory power, like democracy, you know, democracy. And if you if you study and if you work hard, you're going to become rich. The American dream and democracy. These were these were the great levelers. The idea was to level the playing field. Egalitarianism, in other words. But it became malignant egalitarianism later on with technology. We'll talk about it. So this was the idea of the elite. The elites introduced liberal democracy. And the second idea that elites introduced was the nation state. The nation state is a very new invention. It's less than 200 years old. Nationalism, nationalism and democracy. These were the tools of the elites to subjugate, manipulate and control the masses. And both ideas were ludicrous. They were shams. There were utter, unmitigated nonsense. There's no such thing as race. There's no such thing as nation. And there's no such thing as democracy. This is total psychotic hallucination. 
And this sham was an effort to structure the surging mobs, to control them, to prevent the inevitable decapitation, guillotines in the square, riots in the capital on January 6. The elites didn't want this to happen. The elites didn't want Donald Trump to happen. The elites didn't want Hitler to happen, except a few industrialists. And so the elites, elites introduced liberal democracy and they introduced nationalism, very often put together. And it backfired. It backfired. Because to the shock of the elites, the masses wholeheartedly adopted and embraced democracy, adopted and embraced nationalism. The elites became immersed in this augmented reality that the, the, the I'm sorry, the masses became immersed in this augmented reality. The masses adopted democracy lovingly and they regarded democracy as a way to break into the citadel of the elites. The masses adopted nationalism lovingly. They saw it as a way to leverage the power of the masses and take over and redirect the body politic. The elite's inventions, twin inventions, twin shams, twin deceptions, twin illusions of democracy and nationalism backfired on them, backfired on them. The great unwashed, the hoi polloi, the masses, they leveraged democracy. They leveraged democracy. They used it. They put in the White House their own men, Donald Trump. For example, the latest example. And the same in the Philippines, Duterte, and the same in, in Brazil, Bolsonaro, and the same. The masses discovered the power of the vote. The power of the vote was supposed to be a piece of fiction. No one had, had voted. I mean, look at voting numbers. Look at voting rates throughout history. No one used it No one until recently. Recently, the masses fell in love with the voting process. And this is why still the vote or still the election is such a potent hashtag, because the masses are really emotionally invested, emotionally invested in the vote. They regard the vote as their weapon. And they don't want anyone to take away this weapon from them, to steal it as they see. At the same time, technologies emerged. You remember that the printing press actually congealed, allowed the masses to congeal, to cohere, to become a single entity. The printing press disallowed ideas to be disseminated, words to be diffused. The printing press created the glue that held multitudes together. And then recently we had a similar uh, technological revolution of similar magnitude. The new technologies, computing technologies, social media, the new technologies allowed for disintermediation. The new technologies removed the layers of middle class agents of the elites. The new technologies removed publishers. So now you can publish books, but by yourself. The new technologies removed editors, so you have unfettered access to, to news, fake and real. The new technologies removed everyone that stood between you and power. The new technologies empowered the masses. Everyone today can be a television producer, a book publisher, a newspaper, a journalist, etc., etc. Everyone today, with a minimal investment, can be anything. And this is empowerment, which is of unprecedented proportions. It took away, it took away the gatekeeping functions of the elites. The elites controlled what you had read, what you had learned, what you were exposed to, what you saw. The elites via the middle class, middle class editors, middle class publishers, middle class television producers, middle class anchors, middle class everything. The elites controlled your world, your cognitions. The elites controlled your fund of knowledge. The elites decided how ignorant you'll be. And now 
they have lost this via these new technologies. These new technologies disempowered the elites. These technologies are a transfer of power from the elites to the masses in an unbridled way. And this allowed the masses to stage populist coups. There's no other word to describe it. Populist coups all over the world. This allowed the elites to take over the levers of states and establishments hitherto reserved to the elites. So Twitter revolutions, for example, Twitter revolutions, flash mobs, uh, opposition figures, dissidents, encryption devices that allow you, you know, via VPNs and so on, allow you to operate in hostile political environments. These all, this disempowerment of the elites their technological allies and the middle class is of astounding historical implications. This has never happened before. There have been rebellions of masses. There's been the Spartacus rebellion. There has been the 19, 1905 uh, revolution in Russia. There have been many cases where the masses had risen and rebelled. Even the, Jew, the Hebrew slaves left Egypt. There was a rebellion of the masses. Rebellions of masses are documented throughout history, but they were short-lived, they were sporadic, they were point-like, they were meaningless, and they were absolutely hopeless. They were more a statement rather than a movement. The new technologies, the new technologies coupled with one man, one vote, gave the masses the first real chance at power, the first real chance at self-governance and control and self-enlightenment. They've had this chance in the 1930s and 40s, but they botched it. The masses had a first shot at power through communism, through fascism, through Nazism, and they failed. They failed miserably. And so for 60 years, 70 years, the masses had retreated because they had this traumatic experience the masses said, when we get to power, we end up with Adolf Hitler. When we get to power, we end up with Joseph Stalin. When we get to power, we end up with Mao. So better keep away from power. Because when we, we have power, we end up killing each other. Better keep away from power. So for 70 years, there was, the masses were in a post-traumatic condition, following the mass ideologies and mass movements of the first half of the 20th century. But now they have recovered. Plus, they had forgotten. The new generations know very little about Stalin and Hitler and the Great Depression and all these things. And the new generations don't read books. So now the masses are ready for a second attempt. A second attempt at taking power. And it unfolded in the last 20 years all over the world. Putin is a man of the masses. Oban is a man of the masses. Nicola Gruevski in Macedonia was a man of the masses. Bolsonaro in Brazil. Duterte in the Philippines. Donald Trump in the United States. Obrador. They're all people of the masses. They're all representatives of the masses in the centers of power, in the swamp, in the swamp of the elites. And of course, the elites had no intention to take this lying down and they are going to react and we're going to discuss this reaction a bit later but before we do this we need to understand something about the repertory of the elites how do the elites co-opt the middle class how do they subjugate the masses what are the secret tools signaling and messaging that they deploy when they succeed to regain and retake power because the elites have been have been challenged thousands of times throughout history and they never ever failed numerous movements rooted in the middle class for example in 1848 rooted in in the in the masses for example in the 1930s there have been numerous challenges to the elites to the power structures numerous challenges and the elites saw them off the, elite, the elites succeeded to suppress, eliminate, destroy, and reverse every challenge 
ever thrown at them. The elites are very creative. Sometimes they come up with, with sham, sham concessions, such as democracy. Sometimes they come with a unif unifying narrative, such as nationalism. Maybe I'm elite, maybe you're a mass, but we belong to the same nation. Sometimes it, it, they have many ways. And the elites are not a conspiracy. The elites are not a coordinated bunch. They don't pick up the phone every morning and coordinate actions. The elites have common interests, and that's enough. Common interests dictate common courses of action, common behaviors, common cognitions, common emotions, common derision of the masses, common contempt, common hatred, common everything. When you have common interests with someone, you don't need to talk to them. You're both likely to act the same way. And so the elites are, are diff a diffuse mass. They are like more like a cloud, you know. They're more like a cloud. And they're a diffuse mass that permeates every crevice and nook and cranny of society. And they have common interests. Above all, the interest of stability and self-preservation so that they can increase, enhance their wealth and transfer it to the next generation. That's the main interest of the elite, the selfish gene. And so the elites use a variety of psychological manipulation techniques on the masses via the middle class. The mediators, the intermediaries are the middle class. For example, middle class intellectuals, middle class intellectuals write all the influential books and come up with all the amazing, captivating ideologies that the masses adhere to unthinkingly. But the middle class is operating on behalf of the elites. Whatever they say, whatever they do, whatever they write is intended to preserve the system. Very few intellectuals are real subversives. They are not. Even when they sound as though they are rebellious and subversive, they are not. They are hyper-conservative. The middle class is much more conservative than the elites. And all philosophical systems were invented by the elites and the middle class to subjugate the masses. All religions have the same purpose exactly, to keep the masses in check. So religions and philosophical systems, they can be divided into three options. There are three ways of going about it. One, the psychotic school, magical thinking, and misperceiving internal objects as external. And the most famous example is, of course, God. God is an internal object. It's a confabulation. It's a concoction. It's a piece of fiction. And yet, the elites with the middle class had succeeded to convince the masses that God is an external object. It's really out there. And what does God tell the masses? Support the elites. Support the current, the existing order. Don't rebel. Be good, be good boys. Be good citizens. Pay your taxes. Work hard for the elites. Because if you work hard, someone in the elite is getting richer. Religions are instruments of the elite to control the masses via magical thinking, opium. The second school is the narcissistic school. Entitlement, rights, obligations, hubris. The narcissistic school mistakes external objects and symbols for internal ones. So, for example, the rule of law. It's like the law is something outside you, and the law is its own existence, and the law must prevail, the law must rule. But if you have a closed look at the law, the law is a manipulative tool of the elites to take whatever you have, enrich themselves, and then preserve the wealth against your rage, and transfer it to the next generations, to their next generations. The, the law is confiscatory, the law is exclusionary, the rule of law is a code word for stagnation. So the narcissistic school lets you believe that there is something outside you which is bigger than you, more important than you, and demands your sacrifice. I mentioned the law, there's also the nation. The nation is an invention of the elites, of course. So. It gives you the sense that you're in, you belong, that you're accepted, that you're part of the club, that you're a member of a club. You, have, you're, you feel entitled, you feel that you have rights, you have obligations, and 
it caters to your grandiosity. You no longer feel a member of the great unwashed elite, uh, masses. You feel an ototo almost member of the elite because you both belong to the same nation and both of you are subject to the same laws. I have a surprise for you. Laws are for masses, never for the elites. No member of the elite is subject to any law. And when I say any law, I mean any law. The last solution of the elites on how to subjugate and co-opt the masses is the schizoid school, withdrawing from the world and shunning reality altogether. And this is a solution, this is the preferred solution of the elites. They give you mass media, they give you soap operas, they give you reality TV, they give you the internet, they give you all these things because they want to push you away from reality. They want to get you addicted. They want to condition you. They want you to forget about reality because reality is the elites. The reality is 99% of the world is owned by the elites. When I say elite, I mean a few thousand people. And so they don't want you to pay attention to this. They want your eyeballs. They don't want you to have intimacy because any minute you have intimacy is a minute lost to Zuckerberg and Facebook and Zuckerberg's pocket. They don't want you to say anything subversive or controversial or politically incorrect. Or, and if you do, they cut you off, even if you are the president of the United States. They want you to live in a confabulated, fabricated, nonsensical, counterfactual, fallacious fantasy world. They want you to inhabit a dreamscape. They even give you opioids to ascertain that this happens. This is the schizoid solution. In any given period of history, one of these schools is on the ascendant and the other two are on the defensive. The elites experiment with one of these three solutions, the psychotic solution, the narcissistic solution, and the schizoid solution. And some, sometimes, some periods in history, the psychotic solution is the dominant solution. So people believe in gods and religions and angels and I don't know what else. Some other periods of history, the narcissistic solution is on the ascendant. And so people believe that they can become rich and powerful and, and, and so on and so forth because they are sold on an American dream or some kind of dream. And at other periods of history, the schizoid solution is dominant and the other two are a bit recessive. In our postmodern world, the two dominant solutions are alternately narcissism and schizoid. What happened with the pandemic? The pandemic didn't create a single trend. The pandemic didn't, didn't render anything different or new. What the pandemic did was shine a bright light on reality. It forced us to confront reality. First of all, there was a massive transfer of wealth from poor people to rich people. Billionaires in the pandemic had increased their wealth in a single year by 59%. Where did they take this money from? You, of course. They took this money from you. Poor people had transferred their wealth to the richest people on earth. That's the first effect of the pandemic. Second effect, all the sham and fake narratives that the elites were selling you, free speech, human rights, civil rights, democracy, and other bullshit, they are now taking away from you because it doesn't serve them right, right now. So you realize that these were not natural rights. This was not something God-given. Free speech, free association, free demonstrations and protests, free anything is a gift of the elites, is given to you by the elites and can be taken away from you at any minute. None of it is yours, not your property, not your freedom, not your speech, nothing. It all belongs to the elites. They deluded you into thinking that you own these things because there is a law, because there is a nation, because there's a community, because there's a common destiny. They lie to you because there's democracy, 
and you have influence over the proceedings and you have power, they lie to you. Your brain dead and they took advantage of this. And now in the pandemic, you see a suppression of free speech and the elimination outright of the vast majority of human and civil rights. And cast into sharp relief, like under a huge projector, you see who is in charge. And who is in charge are technologies, owners of technology companies, finance, and to some extent, but it's extremely limited, um, other types of businesses. So business, the corporate world, especially multinationals, international banks, international technology companies, they're in charge. They're the elite. This is the nexus. These are the elites. Most of them are billionaires and so on. These are the elites. They rule you and control you. Had it been different 200 years ago? Of course not. International bankers have ruled the world during Napoleon's time. It's the same elites. The same elites ruled Babylon. The same. The people with money, the people with technology, they ruled the world always, 10,000 years ago. The people who invented the agricultural revolution, the people who came up, came up with the industrial revolution, mining mine owners, factory owners, these are the elites. These have always been the elites. They shapeshifted to deceive you. They pretended to introduce members of the middle class into the exclusive elite club. This was intended to deceive you, give you false hope that one day maybe you can belong. It's a deception. No intellectual is member of these elites. They co-opt, they kind of collaborate with certain intellectuals, they adopt certain intellectuals, they elevate certain intellectuals to make these intellectuals feel that, you know, they have real power somehow to move the masses. Who cares about the masses? The masses can move left and can move right. They're useless. They're useless because ultimately the elite is there. Even when the masses did take over, for example, in communism, in Nazism, Nazism was a corporate, I mean, was immediately compromised by corporate industrial interests. So, so was fascism. And communism? Communism fell prey to the managerial class. Who is the managerial class? People with money, people with technological skills. So the pandemic revealed to us how powerless we are and how powerless we've always been. And the pandemic, of course, has geopolitical implications as well. It has accelerated the decline of the United States and restored the historically dominant Eurasian landmass. Throughout human history, the dominant power was China, contiguous China, not the United States. The United States and the West, it's an aberration, aberration established by refugees, criminals, uh, privateers, pirates, and so on. The entire so-called Western civilization is founded on crime, is founded on persecution, is founded by outcasts and outliers. It had not, not, no chance in the world to survive. 500 years, which is the length of Western civilization, is nothing in historical terms. It's a glitch, it's a glitch, it's a, it's a, it's a blip, it's a nothing. And it's ending. Western civilization is ending. It was an experiment by outliers and outcasts. And the elites are going to eliminate it. It took them 500 years, which is shocking in itself. But they're going to eliminate Western civilization. The old powers, the historical powers, which is China and its extension, Russia, the Eurasian table, is rising up again, as it had done for thousands of years, long before there was any concept of the West, when Europe was a big swamp. Russia today is providing weapons not only to Serbia, but to NATO allies like Turkey. Russia had cast itself as an important diplomatic force in the Middle East, not only in Syria, but even in countries like Israel. Russia is emerging as technological and scientific power, both for good vaccines and for bad hacking. But Russia is a minor player. Russia is China's extension. It just doesn't know it yet. China is now pivoting 
from a strictly economic superpower to a military superpower. That's where the game begins. That's where the game is afoot, as my friend Sherlock Holmes would have said. Russia is purchasing critical infrastructure, the belt, the road, Silk Road, critical infrastructure everywhere. Greece, Africa, Latin America, you name it, Chinese are there. Lending, buying, selling, establishing, building. It's a Chinese world. China's soft power has surpassed the United States in terms of lending to sovereigns, online social media, payments and retail platforms, and propaganda. China's GDP is nearly the same as the United States and the entire European Union bloc. What can small countries do? Small countries cannot afford to surf the wrong geopolitical wave. Small countries must strike a neutral stance between East and West, even if it means that sm small countries have to postpone certain supranational aspirations like joining the European Union. Small countries should adopt the Swiss model and welcome everyone. And I think the United Kingdom was a harbinger and a pioneer of this approach with Brexit. Small countries should redirect themselves and embrace industries which do not render them dependent on either superpower services, green agriculture, medical tourism, offshore banking, coding, back office operations, you name it. This is small countries. What can you do as a member of the mass? Opt out. Do not collaborate. Do not be a slave. Just walk away. Nothingness. Adopt nothingness. Not, it's wrong to advise you to go back to a totally imaginary past where men were men and women were women and families were families and nations were nations. There was never ever such a past. It was all an illusionary facade, hocus pocus, perpetrated by the elites. They had deceived you. It was a magician's sleight of hand. It was never real. It was a decoy. Jordan Peterson's vision is a decoy. The guy is delusional. There was never such a thing, the world, the kind of world he described. In this sense, he's indistinguishable from Donald Trump. Make America great again. I don't know when America was great. It was like the um, illusion or hallucination of, of a Britain that had never existed in the 19th century. These are, these are psychedelic experiments by the elites on your mind. To defeat the elites, the masses must walk away. Not walk away from jobs. You need to live, you need to eat, you need to drink, you need to raise a family. I'm not, I'm not advocating uh, becoming a lone wolf in a forest. Walk away from the dream. Denounce and renounce the fantasy. Stop participating in the race. Minimize consumption. Damage them. Fight them back with their own weapons. Democracy is a sham. Don't participate. Consumerism is an addiction. Don't consume. The rat race is designed, designed to keep you too busy to think. Don't quit the rat race. Focus on you. They want you to focus outside. That's why they had created these technological platforms, social media and so on. So that you are so much outside your mind that you are not aware. They reduce your awareness. They, they hypnotize you. They sedate you. They entrain you. These are pernicious, sick, brainwashing tactics. Do not willingly succumb. Don't go into the mental asylum of the elites willingly and, and extend your hands for the straitjacket. Fight back. Fight back by not fighting. Fight back. Civil disobedience. Passive resistance. Opt out. Tune out. Choose nothingness. Watch my new channel. Subscribe to my new channel on nothingness, where I elaborate on these topics.
I hope I introduced some order and meaning and structure into the chaos that is today's world. If you have any questions, post them in the comment section. I'll do my best to respond or even create a new video. Thank you for listening.